Did you know that BDSM and kink are healthy outlets for aggression, imagination, and attention? Hi, welcome to The Partition, home of kinky wellness. My name is Dana Shergel, and I am a sexual wellness instructor that dives deep into all things kinky. I'm here to show why kinky sexual wellness deserves a rightful spot within the wellness conversation. So let's talk about it. Hey, and welcome back to the second episode of the three-part mini-series for the BDSM and Kink Basics. Today, I'm going to be going over Basic 2, which is Impact Basics. Now, before we get into Impact Basics, I want to reiterate that any form of physical contact will never be 100% safe and deaths have happened within BDSM and Kink. No one can prevent all mistakes, accidents, or triggers from happening. The best thing we can do is make the time to practice and educate ourselves with the best resources available and understand that some play types need to be taught in person. Also know that impact play or playing rough isn't a competition of who is the strongest or who can handle the most amount of pain. Impact play is more of an opportunity to test personal limits in a safer, controlled, and educated manner. Although playing with the various forms of impact will increase your chances of receiving marks and bruises, let me be clear, marks and bruises do not indicate a good or a bad session, scene, or play. We cannot predict our body's actions or how they will react. Everything from what we eat to when we eat it affects how we bruise or produce marks, as well as age, fitness level, current mood, and skin type let alone what part of the body is being impacted and with what tool. Some areas simply bruise easier and longer than others, so don't take your impact levels to a place that you can't come back from. But again, who said we needed to take it to extremes? We're just sticking with the basics here, so let's break it down. Impact basics consists of four factors. Zones, tools, importance of impact warm-up and positions, and types. Starting with our body zones, we have six key zones. No-go zones, head and neck, front torso, arms and legs, back and butt, and genitalia. Our no-go zones are areas that, when hurt, can limit how we're able to move, send us to the hospital, or even be fatal. No-go zones include areas above soft tissue organs like your abdomen, torso sides, rib cage, lower back, and temples. No-go zones also include joints. You know, joints are what allow us to move and include body areas like our shoulders, wrists, knees, neck, elbows, ankles. Areas that include lots of tiny bones are also off limits, like the ones on the top of your hands and feet. These areas either keep us moving properly, protect us, or above things that we need to stay alive. Protecting yourself, especially your internal organs, needs to matter more than any form of play. Our bodies may be resilient, but they are also fragile, so avoid no-go zones altogether. Next, we have our head and neck. More people play with their head and neck than you may realize. Hair pulling is an example of this. Proper hair pulling is actually a quite controlled technique, and the safer, more controlled way to pull hair is when you start with your hands at the base of your partner's neck, Then slide your hands up, keeping your hand close to the skull. And as your hand moves, spread your fingers out to secure more area space. Then use your fingers to grab at the root of the hair. Keeping your grip close to the skull gives you more control over the head. If you pull hair by the middle or the ends of the hair, you'll lose control over the head and neck, leaving a lot more room for avoidable injuries. Plus, you're just damaging your hair. Pulling at the ends only increases hair damage. So like really, you are just doing hair damage. Don't do that. (laughs) As for your neck, it's not a beginner-friendly zone for anything above sweet touches or simply placing your hands on your partner's neck with little to almost no pressure. The idea here is that you're simply just resting your hands there so you can get used to the feeling. Because education for play types like this that involve the neck are advanced and this needs to be taught in person. Next is the front torso. Although there are some no-go zones here, the upper portion of our torsos fall on the safer areas to play with depending on what you want to do. One popular example of a play type that works well here is 
flapping the chest area. Extending from your torso, we have arms and legs. Our arms and legs are better for a beginner the closer you are to the torso. Now, although all body types are different, our upper arms and thighs, they typically have more usable space and muscle tissue than the lower part of our arms and shins. The further you move from your torso, the smaller the area generally becomes, right? So from there, then we reach our hands and feet. Now, remember, the tops of our hands and feet have lots of tiny bones that we need to be aware of, but on the flip side of them, on the palms and soles of our hands and feet, they are pretty resilient and can withstand a decent amount of impact, which makes them a popular choice for punishment play. Moving on, we have our back area. Now, the back may look like an area with a lot of usable space, but it doesn't. Our lower back is right above soft tissue organs, and you need to watch for the spine, back of the neck, and tailbone. However, the upper back and shoulders and bum areas are all on the safer side of impact. However, when it comes to our bums, you need to watch for the area that connects your upper leg to your bum. This area is called the gluteal fold, and when it's exposed, so when you bend over, it, it gets more exposed, it's easier to hit. But you need to know that that area typically hurts a lot more than the rest of your bum and legs. Now, the last zone is our genitalia. And I end with genitalia because this is a highly, highly sensitive zone. And I want to stress that you take extra caution when exploring there. It doesn't require a lot of force to make a powerful impact in this area. So when you're first exploring any part of your body... Um, especially when it comes to impact, you need to begin with light tapping from yourself. Light tapping is a great way to see if impact is even something you want to do or explore. So as usual, start slowly and then work your way up to different intensities and speeds. So, you know, you can start with like your hand, you can use a ruler, you can use an impact tool. You need to be able to test different things on different types of your body that are on the safer side. So you know what the feeling is because what feels good in one area doesn't necessarily mean it's going to feel good everywhere else. And while you're doing this, ask yourself if you're liking the experience and sensation. Maybe you just found out that, you know, impact play just isn't something you even want to do and that's okay, but you just need to find out for that information for yourself in a safe and slow manner. If this is a sensation or experience that you want to explore, then you can move to the second factor of impact basics, which is tools. Now, when it comes to tools, I consider BDSM and kink tools different than toys because impact tools are being used with a purpose that has risks inherently built within them. Using tools takes hard work, practice, effort, responsibility, accountability, and accuracy. Not everyone can use tools. However, if taking these responsibilities seriously is something that you are ready to do, then the three impact tools for beginners are our own bodies, paddles, and floggers. Our bodies is the freest form of an impact tool we have. Our bodies can kick, punch, pinch, hold, scratch, slap, bite, lick, grab, spit, squeeze, pick up, put down, and basically just whatever they can do of grabbing and moving things. We're really actually pretty dangerous creatures if you think about it, but using our bodies for impact is more challenging than you think. Each time you have a new play partner, you need to reassess your base strength level against that person and vice versa. To do this, you can start with light wrestling or in other words, participate in rough and tumble play. But the thing that you need to keep in mind is, is impact play and other BDSM and kink activities are like a dance. It's a dance between giving and taking and strength is certainly included in this dance. So to the person who is the strongest in the play, you have more of a responsibility to make sure the play is fun for both. So things to do is, you know, don't overpower all the time. Read your partner's body language. Use your communication cues if you need to and keep your strength in check. And always cut and clean your fingernails beforehand. A jagged or long fingernail carries dirt and bacteria and it can easily cut somebody and you just don't want that. But by knowing your own strength levels and playing that fun rough and tumble play and that light wrestling, it helps you to know your own strength and the force of your own arms and legs and feet and open palms, fists, you know, all of these things, all of these things, they help you to be more in tune with what your body can do. 
And then next are paddles. Paddles are tools with a flat back and a hand grip. I love paddles. You know, paddles are super easy to find in adult entertainment stores and online. They come in all types of different colors and styles and textures. They are budget friendly. They're easy to control. They're easy to pack. You know, when choosing a paddle, it is a good idea to pick one with a hanging loop so you can wrap it around your wrist so your paddle doesn't accidentally slip out of your hands. But honestly, just take a look around your house. Wooden spoons, spatulas, flat hairbrushes, they can all be used as a paddle. Basically, anything with a flat back is good. But of course, when adding anything into your play, check for sharp edges, breakages, splinters, and other possible damage to prevent avoidable harm. The third beginner impact tool is the flogger. A basic flogger has four main components, the butt, the shaft, the neck, the tails, which are also known as tresses or falls. And floggers can be made from about almost anything too, like suede, silicone, paracord, rubber, leather. Basically, any material bound together with a handle could be considered a flogger, but aim to choose something made with good craftsmanship so that it's balanced because an unbalanced flogger will affect your swing. And you also want to choose one in the hanging loop not just because you don't want your tool to slip out of your hands, but because buying one with a hanging loop will also help you to put it away correctly because floggers can either be hung straight down on a wall or they can be, they can lay flat out, but you don't really want the tails to get all mixed up and all that jazz. Now, you know, when you hit something correctly with a flogger, when all the ends come down together. And as always, with any form of impact, before you move to a method with continuous motion, you must master your one strike at a time. So let's say you have your tool, like now what? This is where your impact warm up and positions factors come in. No matter what tool you use, even if it's just your own body, you need to warm up and get in the correct position. BDSM and kink is comparable to a sport, and there isn't a single athlete out there who steps into a game without their warm up. And as you've probably guessed, your warm up happens before you start playing. And there are two types the warm up for delivering impact and the warm up for receiving impact. Stretching is used in both warm ups, but when you are delivering impact, you need to especially stretch your wrists, arms, and shoulders. Your stance needs to be balanced, strong, and secure, and confident. And it needs to reflect how you feel on the inside. You also need to make sure that you're in the correct distance from your target so you don't increase the chances of a wrapping accident. Now, wrapping is the term used when a tool goes past where it was intended and lands somewhere else on the body. This is often a result of bad form or partners being in the wrong distance from each other. Remember, every time you change a tool or walk around, you need to reassess your position to your partner and consider the new measurement that the tool in the space has. And making sure you are in the correct distance from your partner helps to ensure that you don't overreach a swing or cut a swing short, which can also hurt you and your partner. But before you start impact play on a person, your first target needs to be a practice target, like a pillow. Impacting a pillow is an easy way to see if your strikes are accurate because you can see the lines in the pillow itself. Practice using different intensities and speeds and repeat your swings as many times as you need to. Your swings always need to be the same, controlled and accurate. In this role, you are responsible for how you use your tool and how it affects your partner. You must be very aware of your strength and how you use it. So use your warm up to put yourself in that proper, confident headspace. Don't just pick up a tool and start swinging, that is ridiculous. On the flip side, when you're receiving impact, you need to warm up the skin that is going to be played with. This means you need to hit the intended area in little bursts to give it a nice slow introduction to heavier impacts. If you hit skin suddenly while it's still cold and raw, it will cause scarring. An easy warm up to do is a warm up through layers, and you can incorporate this into your foreplay. So, how to do this is you start by being fully clothed. Then gently rub the intended area with the tool that's going to be used. Then give it a few light taps or spanks. And after a few minutes of that, remove the layer of clothing and repeat while going just increasing the intensity just like ever so slightly, right? 
The goal here is to make sure that the skin is warm, but you shouldn't be feeling high levels of pain or anything like that. So keep tapping or spanking with this until there's no more layers. A general rule of thumb is the longer and slower the warm up, the longer the play you will most likely have. But use your discretion and never, ever, ever, ever skip this. Skipping a warm up is only going to shock your system and you're going to burn out way faster than you need to be. Now, impact play can be on the longer sides of play. So you need to be as comfortable as possible, which brings us to the four primary positions to receive impact, which are laying face up, face down, bending over and standing. Laying face up is the easiest position to work with because you get a bird's eye view of your partner's reaction in their most relaxed state. And this exposes the chest, thighs, and genital area. Laying face down is also an easy and relaxing position to take, but you need to watch out for the neck, spine, and tailbone. Laying face down exposes the upper back, bum, back of legs, soles of feet, and palms, depending on how you place your hands. Now, the third one is bending over. The -the over-the-knee position is the most popularized position for this, but you can bend over almost anything that is safe and secure, like sturdy tables, counters, couches, a good one, beds. But just make sure that it's safe and secure, right? Right? That's the main goal here. The fourth position is standing. Standing is the toughest position because it requires a lot of energy and moving is likely to happen, which increases the chances of a wrapping accident to happen, right? So you don't want that. Um, Because for example, if your partner accidentally sways while you took a strike, you could accidentally hit them on the spine instead of the middle of their shoulder if that was the aim. As much as you want your dom to have good accuracy, you know, you also need your sub to stay fucking still. Just stay still. You want them to be relaxed. During basic three, I'm going to go into sex furniture, which falls under personalization for me. But if you have nothing around, you know, while you're standing, you can use a wall for help or you can use a chair, but just proceed with caution. I think when it comes to standing, the next factor of the impact basics is type. Impact play is a large category of play, like a really, 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 really large category. And it includes any form of play that leaves an indentation or mark, you know, such as getting indentations from rope. You can get redness on the skin from wax. You can get bruises that don't take organic shape. Impact types is more than just physical. It also includes mental. So first we have physical impact, right? So in addition to traditional hitting and spanking, there's two physical impact types that give a deeper meaning to physical impact play. And those types are temperature play and cupping. Each of these are beginner friendly when you use your common sense. Temperature play is when you use various degrees of hot and cold to heighten someone's senses. These play types still cause an impact to our skin, but with two very distinct and different sensations. When playing with extreme temperatures and using things like fire, please exercise caution and plan ahead You can get flame resistant bed sheets, use appropriate low temperature flame candles that don't have fake coloring and follow the instructions on them. You know, you got to keep the flame the correct distance away from the skin. You also should have a wet towel or a bucket of water nearby because when playing with fire, you can't be underprepared. On the flip side, prolonged exposure to cold or freezing temperatures can cause hypothermia, frostbite, even death. But Who said you need to take it to extremes? If you want to experiment with cold, try putting some clothes or freezer safe toys in the freezer or simply grab some ice cubes. Then we have cupping. Cupping is such a versatile and unique form of impact that it can be used during the foreplay, main event, and within your aftercare routine. Cupping uses cups to create a localized pressure against the skin And different cup techniques applied in various areas of the body at different lengths of time will give different sensation and colors. They're kind of like hickeys. So if you want hickeys, then you probably into cupping and cupping can be applied to really any part of the body that the cup can stick onto. So popular areas are across the back, bum, breast, stomach, arms, legs. And if you have small enough cups, you can even put them on your cheeks. (laughs) The marks left behind are equally unique as they are strange. 
I really think that if you arrange them in a unique design, it does look like an alien left a kinky code only you can crack. And I think that's cute. Secondly, we have mental play types. Now, this is also massive because many activities within BDSM and kink leave a significant mental and emotional impact with absolutely zero physical impact at all. Examples of mental play types are play types like role playing, erotic humiliation, as well as any play type that uses psychological restraints, such as like following rules or obeying commands. Erotic role playing can really include anything and can venture into any possible direction you can think of. But an example of this is pet play. So pet play is when partners act like an animal that can be real or mystical, you know, hey, humans are animals. So it only makes sense that you want to explore that animalistic side of us. But, you know, pet play is also a good chance not to take life so seriously. You know, soft forms of pet play include curling up to your owner's leg like a cuddle from a kitten or taking it to the rougher side through a straight dog fight. Next is erotic humiliation. Now, this is a subjective issue that differs from person to person, but still soft forms of erotic humiliation can include letting your partner call you names or performing embarrassing, tedious tasks exactly how they want you to do it. And then for play types that use psychological restraints or control, you know, this is, again, this is when one partner follows verbal rules, commands, and take on the tasks that were laid out for them. So some fun examples of this are wearing what clothes are laid out for you or staying in a certain position or place until you're told otherwise. Mental impact types are vast, but you don't need to overcomplicate it because the one thing that they all have in common is that they all require you to use the power of your imagination. So it really comes up to you and how you want to take it. You can start off small. You don't have to take it to these extremes that are showcased out there. So don't think that you need to be anything other than yourself. But there you have it. The breakdown of impact basics from my BDSM and kink e-learning. In this episode, I covered key impact zones, tools, the importance of a warm up and positions. Plus, I gave you a deeper look at the word impact. As always, when it comes to impact and how you play, ultimately, you are responsible for your own decisions and risk profile. I will never advise you to do something that makes you feel uncomfortable or is above your current skill set. But you also need to understand that accidents happen. And again, any form of impact will never be 100% safe. But with practice and learning, we can do our best to make the activity safer. But that's it for me on the second episode of this three-part mini-series of the BDSM and Kink Basics. I will be back next Wednesday with the third installment, the Plan and Prep Basics. If you want to stay up to date with my travels, make sure to follow me on Instagram at thepartition underscore life. Thank you so much for listening. I will see you next week. And as always, stay kinky. Stay kinky.